what's the, the most up-to-date estimate, in your opinion, of the size of this year's sockeye run in the Fraser? The latest estimate is 35 and a half million fish. Yeah. Now that number's been stable for about the last week in terms of the number that have been estimated. Yeah. There's a test fishery out in the Strait of Georgia in Wandafuca, which is shut down now. They're finished. The fish have come, stopped coming to the Fraser. Yeah. They, some of the late runs will hold in the mouth of the Fraser, but pretty much all of those have gone through now that we're into late September. So that number is going to probably be the one that will stick until there's a little bit of tying up of loose ends at the end of the very end of the season. Right. So, but I think that number is that number's probably pretty good, you know, plus or minus a few million, but it's, what is it now? That would be about 20 times the number that we had last year. So. And for a bit of perspective, in terms of the, um, let's say in a one year period, mm -hmm. let's say this past 12 month period, yes. what would be the approximate take in terms of the commercial uh, sockeye fishery? I'm just wondering what percentage of, you know, how many fish get caught versus, versus that come back uh, to the versus run? Versus the number that go back. Yeah. It is usually about something like 20 to 30 percent for, right. for the past 10 years. It used to be higher. It used to be as high as 80 percent being caught uh, up until about the late 1980s. Then there was a deliberate policy to let more fish get up there. This year, I don't know what the total percentage is, and those numbers won't be available for a while yet. Uh, but it was uh, certainly, it was, I would say it was conservative, let's put it this way. Uh, there was not a free-for-all out there. There was still a pretty tight lid kept on things. Ultimately, they shut down the commercial fishery because of concerns about capture of the coho, which come through late, and they were starting in. So that's a ballpark. Yes. And what's the sort of blend between commercial and uh, recreational uh, salmon fishery? Yeah, that depends. The, it's very much on the species. So yeah. uh, Chinook, for example, and coho tend to be allocated very quite strongly toward the recreational fishery. Yeah. And whereas uh, sockeye and uh, uh, pink tend to be uh, more toward the um, the commercial fishery uh, chum as well. So it depends on, on the, the species. I couldn't give you the exact percentages. But the uh, the interesting thing is that the, if you just looked at dollars and cents, which you shouldn't, but it is worth a, it is worth just thinking about this in the overall picture here. Of course, the fish caught in the recreational fishery brings in overall a lot more ac economic activity because right. of the cost of a boat, rod, right. the day, and so on. But on the other hand, you have this... Uh, you know, the, 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 the poor commercial fishermen who haven't been able to go fishing in the Fraser for three years. So right. they, it's uh, it's certainly nice to see this year, for once, there was enough fish for everybody. So are the commercial fishery pretty happy this year? The commercial fishery, I think, were ecstatic about you know, the, the periods they were allowed to fish, but uh, they, the one complaint that uh, that we, we heard was that they wished that they had been allowed to start fishing sooner because it was such a good year. So uh, commercial fishermen, many groups are saying, oh, well, we should have been out three weeks earlier. With hindsight, uh, you would have to agree with them. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you look back at the, the situation here, there hadn't been a, an opening for uh, three years because of low returns. Last year, everybody was caught off guard with the terrible returns. I can't imagine a, a Department of Fisheries and Ocean Manager you know, seriously saying, suddenly becoming optimistic and saying, yes, there seem to be a lot of fish, let's go fishing. And this is a very powerful fleet and, yeah. you know, it really can, can take a lot of fish in a very short period of time. So with hindsight, yes, they should have been fishing sooner, but, you know, they had a great, great year. And, yeah. and I, you know, I, I, I hope that some of the grumbling aside that, you know, they, it's one to remember. It's, it's yeah. a year that, that yeah. their, their parents didn't have and even their grandparents never had, you know, in terms of numbers of fish. So, so you say that in hindsight, it's likely that more of uh, more of the young actually survived a couple of years right. ago. Yes. Um, and can you put just a, provide a bit of perspective and mm -hmm. what percentage or what is the range of percentage of um, you know which fish can actually survive to right. ultimately return to the river? Yes, it varies a lot. Uh, I mean, we're talking very small percentages. Very I think. small percentage. If you think about it, each if it's a stable population, then each pair of fish is producing you know two fish, mm -hmm. right? And so, how many eggs do they lay? It depends on the species, but we, you could be talking several thousand eggs, right? Yeah. So the percentage that go from egg to adult is going to be absolutely tiny. A fraction of a percentage uh, potentially. Uh, yes. Yeah. If you talk about from the you know by the time the, the sockeye are ready to go to sea so they will have been born in the in say they're born in the fall mm -hmm. 
they then in the spring they go to a lake they stay there for a year in the following spring they go to sea by the time they are, are going out you've already lost quite a lot of fish they've been killed by predators in the lakes so yeah, even though yeah. it's a safer place to be than in the sea yeah. so but overall percentage returns if you can get you know a couple percentage that's not uncommon it used to be a lot higher for some species so for example in the Strait of Georgia coho used to have a much higher percentage return than they do now and that's just this is why there's so much concern about lower productivity when you get this low marine survival it's uh, definitely bad news for the overall trends of these fish so they, they ride these waves of productivity and there's so little monitoring done in the sea that scientists are left basically just reacting to how many come back rather than really honestly being able to forecast that. And what other what other species do a strong return um, effect in terms of I don't know seals mm. species of whales mm -hmm. is are there other significant impacts that you can see in terms of other marine life well the one we always worry about are the resident uh, killer whales yeah. in, in this you know out in Juan de Fuca and you know south, southern uh, Vancouver Island now uh, those fish, are, so those whales, are basically Chinook uh, specialists, and one of the real tests, I think, for our management of, of salmon fisheries is to say, well, how, how are you? What tough decisions are we prepared to make if we're going to give the orcas a shot too, and not just you know the fishing? You know, the, the federal government has signed up to a policy that says that they count too, and that's yeah. right in the wild salmon policy. But yeah. to be honest, it's generally not given the priority that it that it that they're signed up to. But, uh, but other species, certainly uh, sturgeon, we think, are certainly going to benefit a lot. You know, we have Fraser River, for example, has one of the world's last great populations of sturgeon right. anywhere, of any species. And uh, there's pretty strong tie-ins, we think, to pink salmon and also to oolican, another fish which has mm -hmm. really bottomed out lately. Mm -hmm. And uh, are any interesting programs you're either involved in or wanting to see or things that you'd like to see happen in terms of uh, fisheries management um, yes. in general? Yes, so the, it's interesting. We have this wonderful blueprint, I believe, anyway, this wild salmon policy. I know policies sound boring, but this is finally what the, the federal government has said. This is what our objectives are. So among all the warring parties, you know, you have the fish farm faction and the recreational fishers, the native fishers, the uh, commercial fishers, you have this document which is trying to find a way through here. And one of the things I guess I would like to see is management that is aimed at actually trying to maintain some of these weaker stocks. Right now, if there's a huge run of fish coming back as we have this year, it's, right, let's go fishing. Well, okay, to a point, but then there are all these weaker stocks that will co-migrate with them. And I think one of the things I'd like to see would be management that's aimed more toward uh, saying, let's not just decide whether to go fishing based on how many fish there are for us to catch, but let's say, do we go fishing according to whether there are enough fish in these weaker stocks? Are there enough fish for the for the killer whales, if we're serious about that, for sturgeon and all of, all of the other species? So, and, and I must admit, the, the research to provide some of those answers has it's still in play. That's one of the things that we do at, at SFU is we're very interested in asking what would the numbers look like? What would the rules, how would you change your rules if you're going to stop doing business as usual and only run it according to the commercial fishery and try to run it according to the wider ecosystem. Yeah.